This story is about someone whom he influenced. Years ago, there was a town, Wilton, New Hampshire. It's still in existence. You can see the town. This is Stony Brook, uh, the Stony Brook near New Hampshire. And they have all these different types of houses. Some of them are still been kept up for all these years. Well, in that town was someone whom Joseph Bates had talked to about Jesus. And then he had talked to her about the Sabbath. So Joseph Bates learned about the second coming, but he also learned about the Sabbath, and he began sharing the Sabbath with people. And there he shared with a woman by the name of uh, Mrs. Smith, he called her, but it was Annie Smith's mom, or Uriah Smith's mom. And Annie's mother said to Joseph Bates, I really wish you could talk to my daughter. She really didn't want to believe much in the Bible at the time. She had actually, since Jesus didn't come in 1844, she felt like maybe he wasn't coming at all. And Annie's mom said, if you could just talk to Annie, that would be great. So one Friday, and her name is Rebecca, for those who, adults who want to see the story, <clears throat> Joseph encouraged Rebecca, that's Annie's mom, to write to Annie and tell her that he would be in Summersville, Massachusetts a few days later. And so that's what happened. Rebecca wrote to her daughter Annie, and that Friday night, two dreams happened. You ever have a dream that, that's unusual? <clears throat> Sometimes a scary dream. Yeah, it can happen. Or it can be a dream just about nothing. One time I dreamed about my sheep, you know, other things. Well, this time they dreamed the same dream. So the preacher and Annie, and Annie's not, uh, not an older, she's, a, she's a probably a late teens, they dreamed the same dream, but from two different viewpoints. So you can imagine the preacher up on the platform dreaming about someone coming into the back of the congregation during the second song. She's come in late, and as she's coming in, the thought comes to him, change your sermon, okay? So that's Joseph Bates, the older preacher, having a dream, and he dreams of a woman coming in, a young woman coming in and sitting down in the back, and the thought comes to him to change his sermon and to preach about Jesus' Uh, work in the most holy place after 1844. So that's the dream that he had. Well, meanwhile, Annie had a dream too. She dreamed that somehow, though she went to church on time, she got there late. And she slipped into the back row during the second song, and the preacher began talking about the very subject that she was interested in, the second coming of Jesus. And so that's exactly what happened. That day, and I'll read it to you, <clears throat> They both awoke, and they both forgot all about their dreams. Annie made ready to go to the meeting in plenty of time, but somehow she got lost along the way to the house. And as she got lost, she eventually found her way, and she made her way in, and they were singing, guess what, the second song as she came in the door. And there was nowhere else to sit, so she sat in the back. And about that time, Mr. Bates began preaching about the 2300 days. It says here that he sent up a special prayer because he, he had forgotten the dream until he saw her come in. He sent up a prayer that God would guide him. He began preaching on that very subject and brought it forward to the idea of not only was Jesus doing a special work, but he also wanted us to keep the Sabbath. Well, after the meeting, it says, he stepped up to Annie and said, I believe this is Sister Smith's daughter, is it not? He knew her even though he never met her. And she was surprised. He says, I never saw you before, but your face looks familiar because I dreamed of seeing you last night. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? He had dreamed of seeing her before he ever met her, and now he knew that's exactly the person. And she said, I dreamed of seeing you. I dreamed of being at this meeting, and everything happened just as I dreamed it. And she added with a little hesitation, I dreamed it was the truth, and now I know it is the truth. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, the house looks something like this, is what some people believe. It was a big meeting. It made it into a meeting house. Imagine her slipping into that house, but long before she ever did, Michael, did God know she was going to do that? Did God know that Joseph Bates would be the preacher up there preaching? And God also knew he had to change the sermon to reach that girl and then to help her continue believing in Jesus. And God did all of that. So I think that teaches us that, come here, Michael. Come here, right here. Let me help you. That God cares for us, doesn't he? If he'll do that, send the same dream with two different viewpoints to two different people and then give them 
the experience that they needed to keep trusting in Jesus, he can do something like that for us. It may not be a dream. It could be a story. It could be something that reminds you of God's love. It could just be something that happens in life that you look back and say, wow, that brought me closer to God. But remember that God cares for you. And if he'll arrange two dreams, the same dream on the same Friday night, to bring two people together, then he'll arrange things in your life to help you know about him too. Father in heaven, thank you so much for each young person here. Thank you for your love for them. I pray that you will bless them, keep them, make your face shine upon them, give them peace, and guide them each step of the journey to be your children until they see you face to face in the new earth. I want each one of them to be there, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats now. Thank you for coming up. Father, you're so good to us. You sent someone by the name of Jesus to help us each individually not only hear your invitation, but guide us after we've responded all the way to that beautiful place you prepared for us. Send the Holy Spirit now to bring this message to home to each one of us until we come home with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for that beautiful music. There is something about that name. And there is no bitterness. There is nothing that's going to pass away. Our appetites could always be stimulated by Jesus, spiritually speaking. I, uh, you know, every once in a while, I go out to eat. Not very often. And I'm not going to tell you what restaurant this is, but this was an experience I had that this week, as I was thinking about my birthday coming up, the thought came to me, I'm not going out to eat for my birthday. <laughs> and let me tell you about this experience. This is actually my wife's birthday back in August. We went to this restaurant with the breadsticks, the salad, and the unlimited soup. I won't tell you which restaurant it is, but uh, it's not the Garden of Eden. Uh, <laughs> at least not this particular experience. I love going here. But as I went this one time, I, I, I described to uh, others how it's happened uh, but I want to try to do the best I can to describe it to you, not for the sense of downing any particular restaurant, but a sense of, I want you to see how very rarely do I lose my appetite, but it happened here. And as I was calling ahead, you know how you can do that. You can call ahead and get a seat for, you know, we had eight people coming, and they asked how many kids and all of that. So I, I thought, this is a good start, right? And you get there, and nothing's ready. So the table's not ready, even though you called ahead. And, I, and that happens sometimes. So you're just kind of like, well, you know, that's, that's a little awkward, but okay, we'll wait for a while. And they got us in, got us to the table, and that's really where the awkward moments uh, continued. As, uh, and I don't usually complain about things, but as, as they messed up on how many waters to bring, how many things of soup to bring, uh, and, and, and I really should have gotten a clue when I told the waiter, we have an allergy here. And they automatically said, oh, and they turned and they walked away and they got another wait, a waitress to come. And that should have been my first clue that I had to be very clear here because all of a sudden I have a new waiter because of this, this food allergy. My family is allergic to dairy. And so if you go to a restaurant trying to get around the dairy, it's very difficult. So the waitress comes over there, the new one comes over there and she says, well, how, what can I get, you, get for you guys? And we began, I began to just describe to her what each person needed the best I could. And I'm not... I get really nervous when that happens because I may not be communicating very clearly and then all of a sudden things go wrong and then it's you know, kind of on me. So we tr I tried to communicate to her the, the allergy idea and everybody placed their orders and I thought it was very clear. And that's when you know, the soup incident happened where there wasn't enough soup, not enough soups came, they, one, they were minus one of that, minus one of the water, minus, it, all the way through it kind of kept building like this until finally the manager came over and after all these things, he must have been taking note of what's going on. He apologized, and we said, well, we hadn't gotten this item yet, and the kids are wanting to eat it. And, and so he said, I'll be right back. So he brings back the, the thing with the broccoli and the french fries, and the french fries has Parmesan cheese all over it. <laughs> so it just, I'm just saying, it kept building, where now the manager himself is bringing the wrong food, and he is really <laughs> feeling bad about it. And finally, it all gets worked out, and he looks at me, and he says, can I get you some more soup? Because I'm looking at this soup, thinking to myself, what else? You know, and, and there was a whole lot longer list than I, I've given you now, but that went wrong. I can't remember them all. I don't usually keep track of wrongs. 
But I do remember losing my appetite, thinking, no, I don't want any more soup. <laughs> I don't want any more. I want to get the check, and I want to get out of here, and I, I'm done, and this has been a stressful thing for me because I was trying to make it special for my wife. And what also happened was we were trying to sing happy birthday at a certain point, and the waitress came and interrupted to, to bring us stuff. So it was just really one thing after another. And so it kind of built me up to the point where I thought, I'm done. I've had enough patience, and I, I said, no, no thanks, I'm, I, I'm finished. And he noticed that, goes and basically writes the check off and tries to make things right. And I said, no, I really want to talk to the waitress to see if maybe I miscommunicated somewhere. I, I, I don't really want to have this happen again. And I was going to pay them for the meal. I, I, was, I was insisting on paying them for the meal. And he's like, no, no, no. He kept, and I said, yeah, I know, I'm a supervisor. I, I, I have employees. I know things need to go right. I've been in food service before. And just because things didn't go right doesn't mean I shouldn't pay you for the food we ate. And he kept insisting and finally I let him do it. And I said, but I have one request, even though I'm not going to pay for it. Can you please send the waitress back so I can understand where she is coming from? And he sent her back. And, and basically, it was as clear as day. But what had happened was a huge miscommunication between there and the kitchen. And it was just the perfect storm that brought that whole thing about. And maybe you've never been to a place like that. But I typically have a lot of patience for the food service people because I've been in food service. And you don't want to... They could be understaffed, they could all of this stuff, but the, still the, the thing remained. The, this whole idea of now all of a sudden, as good as the food was, as good as I've enjoyed that place before, I don't have a desire to, to go there right away. I hope one of those gift cards has, is... <laughs> yeah. I'll give it another chance. <laughs> but I tell, I tell that story not to diss anything, not to even... just the awkwardness of the whole experience. And yet, as I think of that story, and you can think of other stories in your life where all of a sudden you weren't hungry anymore, or maybe you were doing something and you totally forgot about a meal, or think about a time when basically the things that you were seeking after, the things that you put some kind of value in, all of a sudden became to you like a worthless experience. Now I can think of all of this happening with this one picture on the screen. Now here we are in the fall time of the year. But can you imagine the very first fall in this world? Where Adam and Eve realized that death and decay and all this is coming upon us because of something we had done. Something that we had participated in. Something that, and can you imagine now all of a sudden the, the taste of that forbidden fruit? Is it appealing to them at that point? Is it appealing to them when they have to then begin, a sacrifice, they begin sacrificing animals to, and, and they're trying to maintain this relationship with God? Is it appealing to them as you go on down and their first son murders Abel? Cain murders Abel. Imagine now how all of a sudden this world, the things that we value, the things that experiences we think they, they were thinking they were going to get from that whole thing are now all of a sudden reversed. That happens to us, and it's not always at a restaurant. It happens to us in various ways in our lives. A relationship we sought that all of a sudden is ended. A financial thing that we were looking forward to that all of a sudden is gone. All these life experiences that less you shared that just all of a sudden this person's gone and that person's gone. And, and this world just begins to fade in those respects as far as its appeal. That's what I'm trying to illustrate here. Has this world... Have you developed an aversion to this world? Have I developed an aversion to this world? Have we lost our spiritual, sinful appetite to this world? You say, how is that spiritual? Well, there are two spiritual realities. We either are looking forward to the bounties of Canaan, or we're so focused here and now that we don't even desire to taste those things. You can lose your appetite both ways. And so as I think about this experience, the Bible is very clear that the first parents were offered a beautiful meal, a meal of life, a perfect situation, a garden of delight. Each week we have a, the Sabbath that can be our delight. We can still partake of that. But for whatever reason, they chose that meal of death. This knowledge of good and evil. There, was, there are good things in this world, that's true, but there is this shadow that seems to hang over this experience. It's not the Parmesan cheese on the breadsticks. It's, it's something a little more deeper, isn't it? They chose that death. They were escorted out of the garden. 
And I believe that we will get to the place as beings who seek Jesus, we will get to the place where the desires of life and all that this world offers will lose its tastiness. It takes sometimes a good amount of time for that to take place. It may be some bitter experiences. But the Lord brings us through all of that for us not to be somehow saying, okay, God, where were you in all of this? But more of a sense of, this is what this world offers. Are you okay with continuing down this path forever? And then the world begins to lose its tastiness. All the way down through the Bible, you find this link to special meals in the relationship with God. Like the Passover, for instance. It wasn't just about the lamb and everything. It was about this idea of leaving behind something. The bondage. Leaving behind this irreligious, not necessarily irreligious, but basically a religion opposed to God. Leaving behind all of these things to go free and worship God. And yes, it's about the lamb who died for them. But think about these special rites and things that are embedded in the Israelite culture. The goal was not to get them focused on this world. The goal was to get them focused on a greater reality. Even Moses himself, he, he patterned the sanctuary after something that was in heaven. We spent the whole month of October and beginning of September focusing on prophetic guidance, the heavenly sanctuary, the beautiful Sabbath truth, all of these things. But the goal is not to just get us comfortable here. The goal is to get us homesick for heaven. And so Jesus describes a meal at the end of time. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. This is taking place in Capernaum. Jesus enters Capernaum. He, a centurion comes to him, beseeches him, saying, Lord, my son lies at home paralyzed and grievously tormented. You could unpack that and do a whole sermon just on the idea of here is somebody paralyzed, unable to move. What's tormenting them? Grievously. And you can begin to use your imagination a little bit to, to, to figure out what that would be. We're not told exactly how this, how this person became paralyzed. We're not told a whole lot about this other than imagine the person suffering, not just physically, I can't do things, but something is going on in their minds as well. Their eternal value has been diminished to the point where they're suffering. And Jesus says, well, I'm going to come and, eat and heal him. And the centurion answers and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. And we know there's customs about Gentiles and Jews eating together. We know that. But it's, it's deeper than that. There's a humility in this man's words that shows right through here into, the, in, into this situation. He says, just speak the word and my boy will be healed. My boy will be healed. My son, my boy, suffering. Do you have anybody you know, or even yourself, maybe at times you feel like you're that child? Maybe somebody you know, you think of, Lord, if you could just touch them. Get into the Father's motive here. My son is being tormented, he's paralyzed. I just wish that somehow you could touch him, Jesus. Jesus is willing to come, but he also then speaks a greater word of faith. Just say the word, and my boy will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. Basically, Lord Jesus, I am trusting that your word can stretch across space and time and touch my boy and heal him there. There's actually an underwritten sense of not willing to. Um, you can imagine Jesus going into this Gentile's home and, and all the speculation and all the rumors that would spread. So you have, a, you have a, a sense that this man wants Jesus to heal him, but he's also willing to just have him speak the word. He doesn't want Jesus in any way to be tainted through this whole thing. And so, what happens? Well, he hears it, he marvels says to those who are following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. Oh, come on. I mean, he's, he's, he's had all kinds of experiences with Israel, hasn't he? And you think of the experiences throughout the Gospels. He'll be talking to Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. You've got all kinds of individuals in Israel, but not such great faith. 
great faith. Not in Israel. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and as you have believed, so let it be to you. And his boy was healed in that hour. Just a, seems like a brief interlude in the Gospel of Matthew, but a profound reality. At the end time meal, the Messiah's banquet, if you will, Jesus is making it clear. People from every nation, kindred, tongue, and, and group will be there. That's the three angels' message, isn't it? Revelation 14, it's not just to any particular group. In fact, right after the three angels' message is given, there's a beautiful harvest. There's, there, are only, there are two harvests we'll look at in a moment here. But notice there are two groups here as well. Would he say to us, I have not found such great faith in all Israel as your faith as my faith? Because, I mean, we're not, I, I'm not a physical Jew. Here we are this many years later. I've never seen Jesus. I never watched, I never heard these words come out of his mouth right there in, in person. But yet, we could be the ones having this type of faith. I could be the one having that type of faith. Trusting that this is exactly what happened. That he accepted this man. He healed his boy. And he says to that crowd, that group that was following him, many shall come from east and west. Could we be that many? The book of Ephesians says that before the foundations of the world, God called you and called me. Not in a sense that, hey, you're going to be the best team, uh, person on the team. It's not that type of thing at all. It's, it's an echo down through time of your name and of my name. And, the, and this idea of Lego, this, in, in the Greek, he spoke your name. He knew this guy before this incident ever happened. And in conscious divinity, he heals this man, and then he tells his followers, which, Lord willing, we are his followers here today, that many will come from the east and the west. Are you one of those many? Are you responding to the voice of Jesus? Because the other option is to be the sons of the kingdom. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too appealing in this text. I want to be part of the meal that's gathering around Jesus when this whole thing is all said and done. And I don't want anything to get in the way of that. It goes on in Matthew 8, verse 11, And I say to you that many shall come from east and the west. So here's the, the two groups. I basically put these on the screen to show you this, that contrast. And the question came to me as I was reflecting on it, Murray, which group are you in? Would I want to be known as a son of the kingdom? as a follower of Jesus, but not end up in that beautiful gathering at the end. That outwardly, I'm a follower. But inwardly, there's something wrong. Matthew 25, there's two groups, aren't there? Several things that he, Jesus has, several topics he's taught there in Matthew 25 that's something similar to this where you have those who do all kinds of things and they say the right things, they do the right things, but he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. And basically attaches to them, calls them workers of iniquity, workers of sin. How could you do all these things in his name and, and God responds and then basically be attached to sin? And so these two groups are all throughout the words of Jesus. And I believe Jesus wants us to be in the first group. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know when deep down inside there's something that's hanging on to this world that we really need him to deal with. Otherwise, we could go through the motions and say the right words and come on the right day and do the right things when we leave this place and deep down inside be darkness. Darkness. because that's where they end up is in this outer darkness. And they're crying, and they're gnashing their teeth. Those are expressions of not only, deep, not only just sorrow, but also of anger. There's something deep down inside that they have not allowed the Savior to heal. 
I believe Jesus can help us be that first group and then empower us to do something while we wait. Can you imagine being there in Acts chapter one when Jesus is getting ready to go up to heaven and he tells you these beautiful things, he shows you his infallible proofs and he goes up to heaven and the angels say, this same Jesus will come back. Why are you looking up to heaven? This same Jesus will come back. What were they saying to them? Basically, you have a work to do. You're to tell others about this Jesus. And so while we had, I believe that's what our task still is. We're still, that, we're still part of that group by faith that is supposed to tell the world about Jesus because he told them in Matthew 28, go into all the world. All authority has been given to me. I'll step on a toe or two here. There's a whole idea out there that somehow a church or a group or even a denomination has authority. This text makes it clear that Jesus is the only authority. We are all subservient to him and we're in a body and we are humbling ourselves to one another, but he is the final authority. And so as he empowers us to go do his mission, we then are focused on him until he comes. That same Jesus will come again in Acts chapter one. This same Jesus will fulfill all that the prophets have foretold. I have been spending, I don't know, a week, about two weeks on Acts chapter three, just that chapter. It's amazing to see how Jesus, through Peter, tells a message of the soon coming of Jesus, tells how spiritual gifts will be there all the way to the end, all the prophets, their messages will be there. And so this is the experience we will have. He will have a church that goes to all the world and tells the world, that focuses them on the second coming, that has the prophetic gift amongst it, that's encouraging them to look to Jesus. And then we get down to Revelation 14, that final message gathers the people from the east into the west, and it's all about Jesus. That seems like too sugary candy for you. I'm sorry. You don't know Jesus then. Because he's deeper than anything you could ever express or think. Revelation is all about Jesus. Every page in some way points you by specific example or by contrast to Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about him. He himself says, basically all the scriptures testify to him. And so, as we share Jesus at the end of time, yes, it takes on a particular message in the three angels, but each one of those messages points to Jesus, even down to the third angel that says, it warns if anyone, what, follows the beast and receives his mark, keep going on, right? If anyone. It comes down to a personal call from the Savior that says, don't be that one. Every one of those messages could be taken that way, if we would read them correctly in that way. And so as a result of that message, we have two harvests. The grain harvest in Revelation 14, 15 to 16. The grape harvest in Revelation 14, 17 through 20. Unfortunately for those in the grape harvest, it's like Gethsemane without the Savior. You saw what the Savior went through as far as being pressed down in Gethsemane. These individuals have to be, are pressed down, but they have no relief from that. See, Jesus has been pressed down for us. These ones right here, maybe even called sons of the kingdom, look religious, act religious, are part of an organization without a savior. And you know, Babylon and all these things in Revelation basically will become an organization without a savior. The Savior will be right there. You'll think it, somehow you are doing the right thing. The grain harvest are the ones who in Matthew 25, Jesus gathers from the chaff. And these are the ones that are the chaff. In other words, the chaff and the grape harvest. And so these two harvests, as a result of the three angels' messages, leads us up to the controversy between good and evil ending. It ends for both of these groups. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the righteous resurrect, are resurrected. Those who remain are reunited with their loved ones. We're the, that's the grain offering, Lord willing, that's us. Meanwhile, the wicked are destroyed. Revelation 19 says Jesus comes on a white horse of victory. He strikes down those nations. Revelation 19 also says that there's a supper we could be a part of. But Revelation 20 describes a second banquet, the banquet of the birds. 
I don't want to be a part of that one. Revelation 21 says he makes all things new. And now, guess what? We're back to the beginning of the Bible. Right back to the beginning of the Bible. It's taken quite a process, hasn't it? From the time of Jesus all the way down to his coming and all of these events. But now he makes everything new. And we go back to the very beginning. And those two outcomes are there again. Very clear at the end of time. It will be clear whether or not we've eaten from the tree of life or whether we've eaten from the tree of good and evil. It'll be clear because those who eat from the tree of life will be seen as God's people. They will reflect the character of Jesus, which is love. This morning I was focusing on the attributes of God. And I was, I was focusing on the attributes of God. And I, I write down an attribute and I say, Lord, this is what it means to me in our relationship. And as I was writing down attributes, it dawned on me, you know what? Behind all these attributes, his goodness, his patience, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, right? Is love. All of these attributes, all these things we see God doing in our lives, answering prayer, all, those are just outgrowths of his love. These people who eat the tree of life will show that love. They'll be seen as God's people. They'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. They will know him and have that beautiful experience with him forever. The ones who eat of the tree of good and evil, they are called the wicked. Of course, I misspelled it, excuse me. They will be a part of the feast of birds. They will have a second death. Not just the first, but the second death, which is what Jesus experienced in Gethsemane. He began to have the sins weighed upon him, and eventually he gets and dies not just the first death, but he dies a separation death from the Father. And for both of these groups, the controversy has ended. In God's mercy, he ends the whole controversy for both these groups eventually. This group, it ends really just the beginning with life continuing on. This group, it ends with the second death. Sin and sinners are no more. Misery has ended. But I believe I want to be a part of that life group. What about you? Where the journey will have just begun when Jesus comes. And I can imagine, yes, that he uses a white throne, this white horse language. Uh, Is he really going to come on a horse? It's a symbol of victory, we know that. But imagine him coming in his kingly authority, in in his victory. And his victory is for you and for me. That's why Revelation, the seven churches, he who overcomes, it mentions overcoming, overcoming, overcoming. And he wants you there to be ready for him to come. And then he comes in all of his glory, that beautiful rainbow surrounding his throne. I put this one up there because of this little girl. Imagine someone who had died, maybe even in their youth. All of a sudden they're resurrected and can you imagine the joy that they're going to have? You know, some of these pictures of the, us, us going up are mostly adults and they're, they're kind of happy, but a little girl, just, wow, Jesus, you know. That's the kind of joy we're going to have. And we get there and eventually we have that thousand years of peace and eventually we come back, we witness the second death after the city ascends, excuse me, descends. We ascend, the city descends. Eventually the world is cleansed with fire. The new earth comes. We're with Jesus. And as the great controversy says, The years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. Not just Jesus either. We will know the Father even more. And as knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, Oh man, look at that. That's loaded. Amazing achievements. Everything from those two dreams we talked about during the children's story and your life, all those answers to prayer and everything that brought you to the very foot of Jesus in the earth made you. Those are amazing achievements, aren't they? Those amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan. Yes, we have creation, we have the cross, we have all of that, but in each one of our lives, he has done something amazing to bring us there. The hearts of the ransom will thrill with more fervent devotion. Our devotion just grows. 
And with more rapturous joy, they sweep the harps of gold, and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. Revelation makes it clear that it's almost like the whole, whole universe erupts in praise. And yet we could be a part of that. That's amazing. And so, yes, I lose my appetite every once in a while. But as I think of these things in the Bible, I'm saying, Lord, please help me lose my appetite more and more for this world. Help me be so much engaged with you that, yes, I can be of earthly help too, but that my mind is heaven-bound. That for me, by faith, in each situation I encounter, the controversy can be ended and peace can, can be reigning in that situation, in that relationship. And then eventually, I could be at that beautiful meal. Revelation 3 says that he knocks on the heart, basically the door of his church. He comes to his church and says, basically, if you see my, your need for me, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. I will have this meal with you. But I've paid a huge price to provide. On the cross, the biggest example of that. But also his perfect life before that. His trials through his life. Even now as the world continues to suffer at times, imagine him suffering. He still knocks and says, please, take your eyes off the things of this world and join me by faith at this beautiful supper. We're told that in the book Great Controversy, that the supper has already begun. That it, since 1844, basically, he has been wanting us to focus that direction. That should be our goal. To hear his invitation, to focus in that direction. And Ellen White says, the wonderful things I saw there, I cannot describe. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan. Then could I tell a little of the glory of the better world. Of the better world. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and we went to the city. Soon he heard his lovely voice, his lovely voice, saying, Come, my people, you who have come out of great tribulation and done my will, suffered for me, come in to supper, for I will gird myself and serve you. That's right out of the Bible. And we shouted, Alleluia, glory, and entered into the city. And so when the great controversy ends, when everything is basically restored to where it should have been, there's also this idea of this beautiful table being set for us. The great controversy ends, the silver table begins. There's a song that I've asked Jerron to download, and this will be our closing song, so don't worry about uh, playing the closing song. But it describes the language of Canaan. It says, oh, how I wish I could talk in the language of, Ta of Canaan. I would tell a little bit of a better world. And then it goes down to the end of the song. And it's a voice that's representing Ellen White telling you the whole vision of the silver table. And so as you listen to this song, I'm just saying to myself, Murray, let everything else fade away. And by faith, at least at this point in this day, focus on that beautiful supper with the Lord. The controversy will be ended. It will be totally at peace. He will have everything prepared for us. It will be perfect. It's a free meal, but not without the mistakes. And it will be a beautiful place for you and for me. So I'm going to ask Jerron to play that when he gets it queued up. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan I could tell a little of the glory Of a better world Oh, that I could talk In the language of Canaan the glory of a better world where there is no night and the land is the 
light where no teardrops fall. Oh, heaven, it's not like here at all. No, 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 no. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan I could tell a little of the glory mm, of a better world The wonderful things the Lord showed me of heaven I cannot describe I saw there tables of stone in which the names of the multitude of the redeemed were engraved in letters of gold. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went into the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will suffered for me. Come in to supper, for I myself will serve you. We shouted, Alleluia, glory, and entered into the city. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. Then Jesus said, You must go back to earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things of earth look so dreary. I feel very lonely here, for I have seen a better land. Oh, for wings like a dove, so that I could fly away. I'd sail across the river Jordan ooh, to a better place. Where there's sweet repose And the living water flows And I'll thirst no more Oh heaven, I long to reach your shore in the language of Canaan. I can tell a little of the glory of a better world. I could tell a little of the glory of a better world. A better world of a better world. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so great. great controversy will be ended soon. It says one pulse of harmony and gladness will beat through the vast creation. Everything will declare God is love. And so Lord, we look forward to the day when the controversy will be ended. Not only the things we struggle with in our lives, not only the things that we are disappointed with at times, even things that seem good and, and, and wonderful appear dark compared to the beautiful world. So we look forward to the whole 
controversy being ended and the silver table beginning. Guide us each day to gain that focus or regain that focus, I pray in Jesus' name.